When it comes to body transformations, is I'm sure you've heard it's eighty percent nutrition, twenty percent training, and I highly disagree with that. I believe it's eighty percent psychology and twenty percent mechanics. And if we break that down, the mechanics is your exercise and nutrition. So the reason people don't get results with fitness programs in general or long-lasting results is because most programs focus on just the 20% and you know all that effort is going towards this 20% and you know we've all heard the 80-20 principle so why are we spending 80% of our time on the 20%? This program is all about state and story. You know exercise and nutrition are key parts in terms of mechanics and you know, psychology and mechanics both go together. The exercise will teach you a really, really simple but really effective. You really need 25 to 30 minutes per day to execute them. When it comes to nutrition, nutrition is incredibly simple and you know, some of the stuff you would have heard before, but it's just rehashing and telling you this works. You know, the thousands of people we've worked with who have gotten amazing results, they've executed and implemented these principles, but that's the issue. It comes down to implementation. There's this abyss between knowing and doing, and what tends to happen is people know what they should be doing, or they know they should be doing doing something, but they don't end up doing it. And what we want to teach you is how you cross this abyss. And there's a few questions you should be asking yourself, which we will run through. But when it comes down to a story and state, are two parts of the equation which which are huge, which are stopping people from getting results. And those who have gotten amazing results have probably mastered these two aspects. Now. You're probably thinking, what story and state? Now, story is your belief. What is your story? What story are you telling yourself? There's many different things we tell ourselves. I know some people who their story is health and fitness isn't a value to me. It's not a priority for me. Now, on your values hierarchy, if health and fitness isn't up near the top or you know, even near the middle, there is no chance of you completing a health and fitness program. It's a 0% chance. And for some people, it takes things in our lives to happen, whatever it may be. It may be something happened to a family member or something happened to us one day to make us realize that we need to grab health and fitness from where it is and bring it up a lot higher. You know, I've made, I made that choice not too long ago when you know, I was just incredibly busy with you know, family and you know, the business and learning and growing, which were high values to me. But I'll, I'll give you a little tip. If your health and fitness isn't up there as well, Everything else you struggle with. Um, if you haven't got energy and you haven't got passion, you're not waking up really excited for the day, running a business is incredibly hard, growing is incredibly hard, and finding time to spend with friends and family just doesn't happen. So first thing is I implore you to change your story when it comes to health and fitness. What is your story? Why are you actually doing this journey? If you can ask like, why are you doing this journey? And maybe tweak your story a bit so it actually aligns with your body transformation. It'll be so much easier. But there are so many people who have done things before, and I call it the belief cycle. And what happens is, is if we lack belief, we don't tap into our full potential. We don't tap into our full potential. We don't execute. We don't actually implement. And hey, if, if you're lacking belief and you come into it saying, hey, this program's no different, or why is it going to be any different this time? I fail all the time. I guarantee you won't implement everything we teach you. And if you don't implement everything we teach you, to be honest, your results will be next to nothing. And when you get next to nothing results, you'll say, see, it doesn't work for me. And your belief will dwindle even more. So the amount of action you take after is even, even less. So the results you get are less than before. But if you to change your story, change your belief, and there's a few little tricks that we can teach you with this, but if you were to make that change and believe, you know, this is my time, I'm here to own this, then you're coming with a heap of belief, you're tapping into your potential, you're taking huge action, massive action, which is part of the science of success, and then the first week, if it's weight loss you're after, you may lose a couple of kilos. If you lose a couple of kilos, you're going to start momentum rolling. Momentum is the number one reason that the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. And if you get amazing results, your belief will go up. You say, see, this is easy. And you do it again. You'll implement uh, things even more. You'll take more action. If you take more action, you'll get better results. And then you'll be walking around, strutting around with a bit of an ego because you'll find it so easy. And that's what we want for you. We want you to have insane belief, belief that just can't be, can't be shrugged. And if you have that belief, you'll take massive action and you'll get results. And the biggest thing that we tend to find that stops people from, you know, some people may have their story sorted, but they just can't implement things, and it's all about your state. 
Now, when I say your state, there's a few, we call it emotional mastery sometimes. I'm sure you've had emotional eating, everyone's had emotional eating, lots of people suffer from emotional eating, or you may have had a time where you just can't be bothered going to the gym or going to training. Now, imagine if you could control your emotions to such an extent that when you had a bad day, and we've all had that bad day where we think, you know, screw it, I'm just going to go and eat this. Imagine if you could control your emotions in such a way that you don't grab for that food and you're back on track with your nutrition. Or imagine if you could control your emotions to such an extent that you've had a horrible day and just by saying a few words or doing something, you can actually put yourself in a peak state. And a peak state is when you feel amazing. Peak state is when you can conquer the world. Peak state is when you come in and take massive action. Peak state is when you feel phenomenal. I'm sure you've woken up some days where you've woken up and just thought, I feel amazing, I can do anything today. That's what a peak state is. Now imagine if you could bring on a peak state before you go training. So when you go and exercise, you have an amazing um, training and you get amazing results from there. And that's what state elic elicitation or emotional mastery is. Now, you know, really quick though, I'll talk about this for hours upon hours, but some key little things I want to give you right now is what music are you playing on the way to the gym? Now, it's a small little thing, but I'm sure the radios come on one day in a song, and you know for you there's a particular song, and this is things like anchoring, this is why anchoring is so important. Now, there'll be a song that comes on, and you'll be having a horrible day, or you'll be extremely tired, and this song will come on, and you'll just put a big smile on, and you'll be in such a different mood, and that's the change of state. You've gone from a poor state to a peak state like that. That's something simple you can really do right now. So I want you to write down a couple of songs which put you in a good mood. And I want you to put them onto your iPod or onto your iPhone or wherever it may be. And when you go to the gym or just before you've gone to the gym, I want you to play these songs. You know, there's a client of mine who does this exact same thing. You know, with the gym, she was coming in doing all the right training sessions, but she made a small little change and she puts this certain artist on because she has um, emotional anchoring towards um, this band and when their songs come on she has a huge smile on her face and she's in the zone and you know just by making a small change I I'll tell you the huge shift it made she struggled with weight loss but by implementing this small little thing she was getting more out of her workouts because she was getting more out of her workouts she was leaving in a better state because she was in the best state um, because she was walking into the gym in a good state what tends to happen was her nutrition was better. Because her nutrition was better, she went on to lose, I think it was three or four kilos in a couple of weeks when, you know, she, before that, she really, really struggled to drop body fat. So for her, that small little change, I know for you, you may be thinking, that's too simple, it's too easy, but a state of elicitation is saying it's so important. If we're in the correct state, if we're in a peak state, when it comes to nutrition and training, it's incredibly easy. So what we need to do is we need to do something that elicits that peak state, and something as simple as that works. You know, I'm sure there's um, there's some movies that you've watched. Um, for me, it's Rocky. Rocky, I've got so much emotional anchoring to it that when I see it on, I'm pumped, I'm motivated, I'm inspired. And when you look at the belief cycle of the story, when I watch Rocky, I'm inspired, I'm in a peak state, I'm motivated. Because I'm motivated, I believe. You know, if Rocky could do it, I could do it. And it's a, it's a kind of false belief. When I say false belief, is having belief before we actually believe. And what that does for me is it puts me in such a state that you know I take massive action. And you would have had this before with maybe a particular movie or TV show. You've seen something that's inspired you. It's given you belief. And because it's given you belief, you've had this belief that maybe you shouldn't have. But because of that, you're taking huge action. Because you're taking huge action, you're getting results. And, that's what this program is all about. It's about the exercise which will teach you. You just have to implement the nutrition, which is simple. You just have to implement. And when it comes to implementation, which is the most important thing and the key thing between those that get results and those that don't, it comes down to your story and comes down to your state. As we know, nutrition is vital when it comes to body transformation. You know, if you've struggled with, with results before, it's probably because your nutrition isn't up to standard. You may be spending hours upon hours on the treadmill or at the gym and just not getting results. And to be honest, there's probably two things. It's probably either a lack of nutritional knowledge, but to be honest, it's probably a lack of implementation because most of the time we know the fundamentals, we know what we should be doing, but we don't, just don't implement it. And what I want to share with you is complexity is the enemy to execution. 
And with the fitness industry at the moment, you know, they try and use huge words and stuff actually to confuse people. Because if they confuse people, people will think this option is better than the conventional. And, you know, what I'm trying to tell you today is simple is best. The conventional, the foundations of nutrition work. The foundations of nutrition can take people from, you know, having average physiques to being Adonis is on stage in bodybuilding or they can help someone lose 50, 60 kilos. And if these same principles can take someone to looking like an Adonis figure on stage or help people drop a ton of weight, then they'll 100% definitely work for you. But the thing is you have to make that distinction, that choice that you're going to commit to this program and commit to implementing the nutritional protocols. And I know that you may have some previous learnings of you know doing some maybe low carbohydrate diets, wherever it may be, and they definitely have their warrant, but you know, if we can leave all previous learning aside and just leave it all aside just for now, and I'm sure once you take this approach, you'll never go back. Now again, I said complexity is enemy execution, and we're gonna make this really, really simple. And some of the points I bring up, you're gonna be like, hey, Nari knew that, or I've heard that before. But trust me, it works. We have thousands of documented cases of this working. Now the first component is food. Now it sounds really simple, but what food should you be eating? Not just for weight loss, but for how you're gonna feel. Because if you're having all these energy dives and you're getting cravings, then it's gonna make the process so hard. There's so many you know, nutritional programs out there that actually work from a scientific backing, but they don't work in the sense of it's not easy to do. If it's not easy to do and we're getting sugar cravings and we're getting moody because we've got no carbohydrates in our body, it's not going to last very long. After that, it's the portions. Sometimes we can be eating exactly what we need to be eating, but we're just having too much of it. And you can't have too much of a good thing. And you know, what I want to tell you is if you do eat the correct foods on our recommended food list, but you don't have the correct portions, you can gain weight or you could just stay at a plateau. Now, the third part is combination. I'm sure before that you've probably cut out some carbohydrates or maybe been on a low fat diet, whatever it may be, but I'm here to tell you that you need a combination of everything, not just for weight loss, but how you feel, making sure we're getting our micronutrients, making sure we're getting things like our fiber in. Next part is timing. Now, when should you be eating? Now, it's a very important question because what works for me may not work for you, and it may not work for your best friend, it may not work for your family. And what we want to do is we want to find out your patterns. So when do you crave certain foods? When do you normally binge? What patterns are you exhibiting right now which we can lock down on and actually plan around? Because if we plan around, it makes it so much easier. There's patterns which you do day to day, week to week. And you know those patterns are stopping you from getting your results. So if we can isolate them now, and I really implore you to you know sit down for 10, 15 minutes and write down particular times when you're craving. So you can even do it today and tomorrow. Find out exactly when you're craving certain foods. Find out you know when you're getting hungry. Find out when you know you're lacking time for food, so you're going for bad options. So then we can develop your plan. Final step is support. Support is vital because when you're going through this journey alone, it's incredibly hard. But if you have someone there just to say, "Hey, how are you doing? Are you, you know, are you are you implementing everything?" Um, if you have people around you who are doing the exact same thing as well, it makes things a ton easier because you know we make change for two reasons: desperation or inspiration. And it may be desperation at the moment, but if you can move it over to inspiration, it's so much more empowering and saying that you know, will hold you in good stead in the long term. So this program really is developed from the nutritional side for stuff that not only can you, can you do for the next six weeks, but you can do for the rest of your life. You know, after watching um, this video, you have two choices. The first choice is you can implement everything and get amazing results and just stick with this for the rest of your life, which will be, you know, in terms of variety, will be enjoyable. In terms of results, will be amazing and you never have the issues that you're having at the moment. The second choice is you can go half-hearted at this. And same way, if you give 50% anything to you know business, to life, whatever it may be, you know, you don't get 50% in return, you get 10% in return. So I really need you to give this 100 percent because if you give 50%, you get average results. You'll just be stuck in that weight loss cycle where you'll be jumping from strategy, 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 and you'll never be happy with your health and fitness. So I'm pulling you to make that decision right now. I need you to write down on a piece of paper, I am committed to sticking to this nutritional program for the next six weeks. And after I get amazing results, I'm committed to sticking to these principles for life.
if we break down the food component, it becomes really, really simple. You know, again, so, sometimes we make things overly complex, and when we make things overly complex, we're overwhelmed, we're not sure, and we go for options which we 100% know we shouldn't be going for. But if we break it down into proteins, our carbohydrates, our fibrous vegetables, and our fats, and again, every single meal is made up of these components. Doesn't matter whether it's a healthy salad or a pizza. They're all made up of these components. Now, the first component, the protein, the first choice of when you make is moving from fattier cuts of meat to leaner cuts of meat. So the first change could be purely instead of eating maybe uh, chicken legs, you can eat chicken breasts instead. And firstly, they'll make a huge difference when it comes to weight loss. When it comes to our carbohydrates, the main thing we're looking at is our energy levels because if we're getting sugar cravings and we're getting tired, we're more likely to binge, we're more likely to eat stuff we probably shouldn't. So I want you to move towards low GI options. When I say low GI options, we're going for nutrient dense carbohydrates rather than calorie dense. And again, in the recommended food list, you'll see the proteins and carbs that we recommend. But little changes like, you know, going from carbohydrates that are just packed full of sugar and substituting that for things like pumpkin or sweet potato. Pumpkin is really low calorie and there's heaps of nutrients. And not only that, will give you sustained energy. Now, when it comes to our fibrous vegetables, this is the distinction we need to make. What's a carbohydrate and what's a fibrous vegetable? Because lots of people think things like sweet potato um, count as fibrous vegetables. Problem being is, with our fibrous, fibrous vegetables, we can eat as much as we want. We can stack it onto a plate and really fill ourselves up. Now, if we were to do that with sweet potato, as I said, you can't have too much of a good thing. And if you do that with sweet potato, you take in a heap of extra calories. And again, you can gain weight or even stay the same while eating the right foods. Fibrous vegetables are things like our broccolis, things that are really, really low in calories but hugely nutrient dense. So again, you'll see on the recommended food list what fibrous vegetables to be eating. And with them, you can have nearly as much as possible. You know, the final part is our healthy fats. And you know, with, with our healthy fats, they, they help regulate our hormones, they help with fat loss, they help with brain function, they help with so many things. They help with our mood as well, which is vital when we're trying to master our emotions. But the issue is with our healthy fats is sometimes we're not having the right portion size and we can have a meal that's really, really healthy using all the correct foods as I've listed. But if we're having too much fat, we're gonna have a heap of calories. Remember, fat is more calorie dense than our carbohydrates. Fat is more calorie dense than protein. And that's where the amount comes into the equation. What portions should we be having? Because you know, if we're eating all the right foods and we're just not losing weight, it's because our portions are out of whack. It may just be some small changes there, but the cool thing about that is if we just reduce our portions, we can have amazing results. And again, in this nutritional program, you'll see how simple it is to lose weight, how simple it is to make that body transformation because you know, from a list of things, it may only be one or two things that you actually need to change. And it may be incredibly easy. You may be eating exactly what you're eating right now, but just making those few distinctions and you'll see your results go through the roof. Now, with the amounts, we stick to some really easy, simple principles because when it comes to weighing food, people start off measuring food and you know, weighing on the scales, but over time, they just don't do it. Honestly, I know no one who's been weighing and measuring food for the whole entire life. So if we can't do something for the rest of our life, there is no point in doing it from the start. So when it comes to our proteins, really, really simple. Look at the palm of our hand. So a source of protein should be the size of the palm of our hand. Carbohydrates after being cooked should be the size of our fist. When it comes to fibrous vegetables, a heaped hand, pretty much as much as you can eat. It's, it's very, very difficult to overeat fibrous vegetables. And when it comes to healthy fats, just the tip of our thumb, just enough. If you stick to these portion guidelines, you'll get amazing results. It's really, really simple. And you know, just by using the one hand principle, which, which we call it, it's incredibly, incredibly simple to stick towards our portion sizes. Not only that, it's something you can do for the rest of your life. It's simple. When it comes to nutritional programs, it's normally about cutting out carbohydrates and cutting out fats, when it actually has an adverse effect on our body. When we cut out carbohydrates, we have this metabolic adaption that happens, which we really don't want. And we have things like, you know, our leptin hormone, which is king of all fat burning hormones, actually decreases, which really isn't what we want when we're trying to burn body fat most of the time. 
On top of that, things like fats, fats have numerous roles in the body, such as you know, helping with brain function. If you've ever had that foggy brain while dieting, it's because your fat levels have been pretty low. Now again, we're trying to keep our proteins, our carbohydrates, and our fats. The main thing is just to focus on the right amount of portions and the right foods when it comes to these macronutrients. Now when it comes to food timing, as I've touched on, it's really, really vital. It's not vital for the reasons most people think. The reason that it's vital is because we do have those times where we crave food and hey, we just have to accept that's, that's us, that's you, that's me. And what we need to do is we need to actually plan around it. So if just say me, I crave food at 9 p.m. at night, I need to plan a snack at 9 p.m. because if I have all my meals and all my snacks before, I will still crave sugary foods at 9 p.m. So the key thing is knowing when we're craving certain foods, you know, when we're really strict for time, when we may be out and have no access to good foods, and we need to actually implement a plan, implement some foods that we can have during then, so it's not an issue. We are now creating your plan. And again, this is your plan specific to the times you're craving certain food and specific to your lifestyle. Now, the questions I want to ask you are, when do you crave certain foods? Now for me, I crave sugary foods around 9pm, maybe 9.30pm. So I need you to isolate right now for me when you crave certain foods and what foods you crave. What we'll then do is we need to put something in that time slot. So just say for me it's 9pm and I crave something sugary. So what I do with my meal plan or my planning for my food is I'd put something like a protein shake because it's quite, you know, has some artificial sugars um, which aren't bad for my body. I'd allot that and put that at 9 p.m. So if I was creating my daily plan, I'd have down here 9 p.m. Uh, protein shake. Now, if you can do that for me right now with your own plan. The second thing is when do you make bad food choices? So for some people it may be at 3pm because they've just finished work and they're quite hungry. And because they're quite hungry they've got no access to really good food so they might pop past a local takeaway. Or for others it may be around 10am where they haven't had breakfast and because they haven't had breakfast they're getting hungry. And because they're hungry they're reaching out for things in the office and there's no good choices. So when you isolate, when exactly do you normally make bad food choices? So if just say it's 10am for you. So we're right up here, 10 a.m. And just say you're not having breakfast, so you're extremely hungry, and you're going reaching for things. First thing that we could do is we could have breakfast at 7 a.m. So it kind of tides us off, so we're not having those cravings. Second thing could be we could be pre-preparing a certain snack, so at 10 a.m. we do have access for better options. So maybe something like a Greek yogurt with berries. Now, the third part is, what meals do you need to plan ahead? Now, if just say, for example, your son plays football and he train, trains um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and you don't get home until 7.30 p.m., that may be a time that you need to plan ahead. That may be a time when maybe on Sunday you need to meal prep or maybe you need to go um, cook up some extra meals Monday, so Tuesday and Thursday you have easy access because one of the biggest reasons that people aren't successful with body transformations is because little things like that will pop up and you know that they're popping up but because you haven't planned it kind of gives us an out because we're tired because we haven't planned we'll have some poor options we'll have takeaway or something like that so i need you to write down right now for me what days or what meals during the week you need to plan ahead next thing you need to do is how are you going to plan ahead some options are the first option may be is that on sunday you do a huge cook up Second option may be Monday dinner, you may cook up some extra portions, put them together, put them in the freezer, and you're good to go. The idea with your plan is we need to see when you crave certain foods, what do you, um, when do you make bad choices, and what meals do you need to plan ahead so straight away we're ahead of the curve. It's game changing when it comes to fat loss because normally these three things here is what trips us up. Normally we'll be really, really good, but these three things here will pop up and they'll push us off of the wagon. As we've just ran through an example before, this would be an example plan for the person I just ran through. So this person 
was making bad food choices at around 10 a.m. So what I've done as part of their plan is firstly they're having meal one, which is their breakfast at 7 a.m. They are then taking something like yogurt with them in the fridge. So at 10 a.m. when they have these cravings, they have something to grab. They're then having their 12 p.m. as it's lunchtime. After that, a 3 p.m. snack because you know sometimes that's when they crave certain foods. So we're preparing that as well. Finally, as you see down here, meal three. If meal three was on a day when football or something like that, it might be 7 p.m. And what they do is they'd actually eat one of the um, frozen meals they prepared. But in this instant, that's not the case. And they'll have dinner as per usual. But this person here gets really sugary cravings at around 9 p.m. So what I've done is I've planned ahead and I've put snack three here, which would be a protein shake. So as you can see here, this plan is perfect for the person I just mentioned. And if they follow this, they won't have any of those sugary cravings or they won't be making bad options because we've planned ahead. You need to make a plan right now that's specific to you and covers those three questions that I've just asked. I'll now teach you how to make your meals. Now, when it comes with dieting or any nutritional programs, the biggest thing I hear is the food isn't fun. And you know, my answer to that is sometimes the food may not be fun, but the results are fun. Um, with what I'll teach you right now, you'll see how you can have so much variety with what you're eating. And you know, the food that you're actually eating right now, you don't have any more variety than what you will moving forward. Because as we can see here, let's run through meal three of the person I just spoke about, which for them would be dinner. There's a few options here. There's a chicken wrap, there's a burger, there's sweet potato, steak and veg. And all these meals are exactly the same. If I break it down a chicken wrap, you have the actual bread, you have the wrap, that's a carbohydrate. You have the chicken, which is a protein. You have the um, salad, the lettuce through there, which is the fibrous vegetables. And then you have a little bit of dressing, wherever it may be a small amount, which is the fats. If you go into a burger, you have the bun, which is a carbohydrate. You have the meat, which is a protein. You have all the lettuce and stuff, which is the fibrous vegetables. And then you have a little bit of fat. The third meal, sweet potato, steak and veg. This is one of those meals that people dread because it seems so boring. But if we look at sweet potatoes, a carbohydrate, steak is a protein, and the veg is the fibrous vegetables. And every single meal is made up of the same fundamentals, proteins, carbohydrates, um, fats and fibrous vegetables. It doesn't matter whether it's a burger from Hungry Jack's or whether it's a chicken wrap that you've made that you believe is incredibly healthy. They're all made up of the same components. The key things are, if we go between a chicken wrap that you may make at home or a chicken wrap that may come from a, a fast food store, I guarantee the chicken is probably a real fatty color chicken, which goes against our lean meats principle. Uh, second thing is it probably drizzled in some sort of sauce which would be high in sugar and would have probably a heap of fat in it. On top of that, um, you know, things like the bread that they use, they probably go for more calorie dense actual wraps. Um, whereas the chicken wrap that we'd make, it'd be a lot lower calorie, it'd have a leaner cut of meat, it wouldn't have as much sauce and so on. So when it comes to a meal, you can make literally anything you like if you just follow the principles. So right now we'll make a pizza based on these principles just to explain my point. So if we look at the actual base of the pizza, so we'll go the base is a carbohydrate. Now the key things we're looking at with the base is does it fit our portion rules and with things like the base of a pizza it's harder because we can't just go and look and say hey it's the size of our fist but we can look at the lower calorie options so if you've ever seen uh, a chicken wrap, the actual um, bread for that, we do something like that for our pizza because lower in calories. And if you kind of put it together, it'd be the size of your fist. So that's the carbohydrate. The next thing is the protein. So if we were to put a heap of lean meats, like some chicken breast and some leaner cuts of red meat on there, that's our meat on top of the pizza. The next thing is the actual fibrous vegetables and things like tomato, you know, if we mashed up into a real um, puree, um, we could use that as the actual um, sauce on top. So the sauce could be tomato. And then when we're looking at our fibrous vegetables, we could put things like onion and all of that on top. So as you can see, even things like pizza are made up of the same fundamentals. The key things are, are our portions correct? 
Are we getting extra calories from source, which is one of the huge mistakes I see people make. But if we follow the lean meats principle, what foods we should be eating from the recommended list, if we take that and we apply that with the right portions amount, we can make literally any meal you like. And that's why Paleo's program is actually having to be a fun, trying to make foods that you know uh, are really exciting that most people think no way can you have that on a diet. But as you can see, there's so much flexibility. We're now talking about your snacks. What snacks should you be having to get the results you're after? Now, with the snacks, I like to keep it really, really simple. First thing is under 200 calories because some people will have these snacks, but they're extremely high in calories. They may be good for us in terms of the foods we're using, but they're so high in calories that people are gaining weight. The second thing is nutrient dense over calorie dense. So when we're choosing which snack, we've got to ask ourselves, what is this doing for our body? You know, there's so many protein balls or protein cookies we can make that utilize things like oats, which you know, we get our fiber, we get our proteins and other things from. They're more nutrient dense than maybe picking up a handful of lollies because we can find some lollies that are under 200 calories. Again, there wouldn't be many, so it wouldn't fill you up. But if we substitute something like that and went for nutrient dense foods with a lot of fiber, firstly, you'd be more full and secondly, you'll feel the heat better. So when it comes to your snacks, you'll see some of the approved snacks um, on our list are really, really simple. And I want to keep this part really, really quick because, you know, under 200 calories and nutrient dense, if it ticks off those boxes, then go for it. I'm going to share with you the seven huge mistakes I see people making every single day when it comes to health and fitness programs, which are actually stopping them from getting results that they're after or losing their weight. And all these seven things are very, very simple. But they're very profound in such a way that just by making one of these changes, you can lose half a kilo to a kilo a week purely by one change. And when people try and make these huge changes, they get overwhelmed. And when they get overwhelmed, they do nothing. And that's normally where um, the lack of results come from. But imagine if you just had to make one or two changes, that's it. And by making those one or two changes, you can lose a kilo a week consistently. Now the first one is fatty meats. Now before we get into that, I need you to realize that 1,000 calories a day equals one kilogram of body fat per week. So if we're reducing our calories by 1,000 per day, um, whether it be you know through reducing the amount of um, the amount we're eating and adding in exercise, we can lose one kilo of body fat really really simply. Now fatty meats. If we make the change to go from things like chicken thigh or chicken leg to chicken breast, you know, change from chicken leg to chicken breast can be, you know, 400 calories per day if we're having that, you know, twice a day. Over the space of a week, that's 400 grams. Now, if I could tell you that if you went from fatty cuts of meat to leaner cuts of meat, you'd lose 400 grams of body fat per week, I'm sure you'd make that change. It's really, really simple. Second thing is coffee. You know, many people drink three, four, even five coffees per day. And in these coffees, they may have sugar, and those that don't have sugar, they're putting milk in there or they're putting cream. And you know, even though it may be just a small amount of milk or cream, it really, really adds up. Or even if it's just one coffee of sugar, in the long term, it, it adds up. And it could be two, three hundred calories per day, which again, if we do the math, that two, three hundred calories per day could be two hundred or three hundred grams of body fat that we could drop if we substitute that out. The third thing is soft drink. You know, I really don't recommend that we take in calories through liquid form. Through things like protein shakes is all right, but you know, there's many people that will hit plateaus and they've hit a plateau and they're actually having two or three soft drinks per day, which equate to a thousand calories. And I, I need to go through a math to show you that's a kilo of body fat a week if they make that change. And they'll be eating everything correctly. They'll be exercising really, really hard, but they're just not getting the results and they've hit that plateau. I, I knew so many people have made that one distinction, taking out soft drink and you know going towards things like water and stuff like that. And when it comes to weight loss, it goes through the roof. The next thing is portions, and to me, portions is you know the number one thing when it comes to fat loss. You know, calories are king. If you're consuming less calories than you burn, you'll you'll drop weight and burn body fat. But it comes down to portion size because if we're eating the right foods but we're not having the right, the right portion amount, we're going to gain weight. And, and vice versa. So when it comes to portions, it's not just our portions of you know our foods, but it's our portions of our sources, which is the next part. When it comes to sources, you know we'll have a real healthy meal where we've got our fibrous vegetables, right amount of carbs, and everything is correct. But 
if we're smothering some sauce which is packed full of sugar or packed full of fats, wherever it may be, high calorie, we could be adding in an extra three, four hundred, even five hundred calories per meal just purely through sauce. So the change I want you to make right now is not having, not using those conventional sources and moving towards herbs and spices, things like garlics. And if you make, make that change, not only will your food be tastier, but you reduce by, you reduce by so many calories. And by now, I'm sure that you've probably seen a few of these things that you can tick off and say, hey, I can make that change. And if you've ticked off one, two or three things already, and I'm only halfway through, then you can drop a you know, kilo to a kilo, a kilo and a half of body fat purely by making those small changes. Now, no exercise, you know, I've, I've heard a few people say that, you know, I want to focus on my eating before I get into my exercise, or exercise for them is just a way of boosting their fat loss. Firstly, exercise has so many other benefits, just that they affect our quality of life, and I can't understand why everyone doesn't exercise. And part of this program is spreading the word and making exercise a part of your life, not just for weight loss and for toning, but a part of your life so you can live at a higher quality. So you don't have these nagging injuries or a nagging sore back, wherever it may be. So you can pick up these things rather than bending over and pull your, pull your back out. But when it comes to exercise, people focus so much on nutrition and you've heard it's 80% nutrition and 20% training. And I think um, that saying has really you know, hurt people in regards to them believing that, hey, I'll just focus on 80%. When it comes to exercise, exercise, especially high intensity training, resistant training, boosts your metabolism. And what happens is when we die, our metabolism tends to adapt, it tends to slow down a bit. There's been numerous studies proving this. But by doing resistance training or you know, high intensity training, it actually boosts our metabolism up. So while your friend is just doing the nutrition side, not doing the training, they may be losing quite a bit of weight or the same amount of weight as you. Realize that moving forward in the future, their metabolism is slowing down, so their results are going to dwindle. Where as you, because you're doing the exercise and you're following our exercise protocols, your metabolism is probably higher than it ever has been while you're dropping body fat. And the final thing is not consistent. You know, the person we see in the mirror is what we do most of the time, not some of the time. And when it comes to uh, our weight loss or training programs, I see so many people that say, oh, you know, most of the time I do this or some of the time I do this. If you're only executing these principles some of the time, like for dinner you're having a healthy meal but the rest of the day you're blowing it out, you'll get next to no results. It's what you do most of the time. You need to make these things a foundation. You need to make these portion rules, you know, the, the proteins, the carbohydrates and the fats. The principles that we've laid down and we've taught you today and you've seen in your booklet, you need to make them part of every day. And if you do this 80% of the time, if 80% of the time you're executing these principles and 20% of the time, you know, maybe you're not executing properly and you're having some snacks that maybe, you know, you shouldn't be or whatever it may be, it's going to be all right. That person that you see in the mirror is what you do most of the time or some of the time. So if you execute this most of the time, you'll get incredible results which you um, could never believe. But it's really simple. Here's the seven huge mistakes that I see by working with thousands of people. These are the seven things right here, and if you choose which ones work for you and which ones you're not doing, which ones you can change, it's really, really simple. You know, the program is simple for a reason. It's simple because it works. It's simple because, in essence, body transformations are simple, not easy. And when it comes to the nutrition side, let's just find a strategy that works, and this strategy works, these things work. These are the seven mistakes people normally make. So if we can make this small little distinction, and yeah, moving forward after today, if you can say, hey, this one, this one, this one here, apply to me, I'm going to make those changes, you know, it's guaranteed you're going to get amazing results in your programs. You see, group A and group B, and what I want to do is, in the video, just explain to you a bit more of exactly how it works and why we put it together like that. So, for example, upper body day, um, which might be Monday for you, you see group A and group B exercise, so you need to pick three group A and three group B exercise from the list providers, you know, try to find things that are going to, you know, push you and make you work hard. But if we take, for example, group A is an A, B, and C exercise and D, E, and F exercise, what will we end up looking like is A, D, B, E, C, F. So we're going from a group A exercise to a group B to a group A to a group B to a group A to a group B. Now we do all six exercises without break, and we're aiming for about 12 reps in total. So what we're doing on upper body days, we've got group A is a lot of our pushing movements, whereas group B is a lot of our pulling movements. 
So while we're doing just say exercise D here, which is group B, we've just done our pushing movements. We've actually got a little bit of time for um, certain muscles like our chest and our triceps to actually recover while we're working our you know, back and biceps or maybe a pulling motion. So it's been structured in such a way that not only is it efficient, but you get a lot of volume and a lot of intensity in it. And starting off, I really want you to aim for 12 reps. Now, what weight should you be lifting? Well, you should be lifting a weight that by the end of the 12 reps, you should be quite fatigued. You know, by the last rep, you know, of, of each exercise, you should be really, really fatigued where you're like, you know, I can only do one or two reps max after that. The idea is by the end of doing all six exercises, your heart rate should be up, you should be nice and fatigued and pretty buggered. And after you've done that, you want to have a two minute rest. A two minute rest of just walking around, rehydrating, getting the weights ready, and then into set number two. And I want you to repeat that five times, so you end up doing five sets. So really this should take you, you know, 25 to 30 minutes maybe. The key thing is the tempo that we're using. If just say we're doing bench press, we want to take two seconds on the way down and one second up, okay? We don't want to be going really, really quick. If you want to, you can even go three seconds on the, one day, on the way down and one second on the way up. It's all about slow, consistent movements. It's about controlling the weight rather than do, just doing as fast as we can. Now, with lower body day, it's been designed a little bit differently. If we were to just do six exercises of legs, we'd be absolutely buggy by the end of the first set. So, Group A is lots of our uh, leg exercises, whereas Group B is a mixture of high intensity exercises and some ab exercises. So what happens is with the Group A exercises in the lower body, we're doing 12 reps as we were before. But with the Group B exercises, we're doing as many reps as we can in 30 seconds. So if we're doing burpees, we're you know, trying to do as many reps of burpees as we can in 30 seconds. Or if we're doing crunches, we're doing as many crunches as we can in 30 seconds. So what that may look like is Number A may be a barbell squat where we're doing 12 reps. Number D may be burpees, and maybe in 30 seconds we may do uh, six burpees, whereas exercise B here may be sumo squats where we're doing 12 reps. And E may be something like crunches. As you can see through there, and once we've done all six with no break, we're having a two minute rest and then we're repeating five times. You know, this has been designed to be incredibly simple. You literally pick three from group A, three from group B, and follow up from there. But what you want to be doing is you want to be tracking each week how much weight you're lifting and how many reps you're doing if you're doing you know, as much as you can in 30 seconds because the idea is, is progressive overload. So it's progressively over six weeks lifting more because day one when you're just say doing bench press or you're doing some squats, you may lift X amount of weight. But five weeks later when you're so much stronger, if you lift that same weight, you're not going to get the same return, so you might need to lift a little bit more. And that's why tracking in your transformation journal makes things so much easier. Now when it comes to full body day, full body day is really simple. You have group A, group B, three from group A, three from group B, and just follow exactly how you do the upper body day when you do 12 reps of each. Really, really simple. High intensity interval training day is really, really simple and the workout can go anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes. If you're a beginner, I recommend just 20 minutes, but if you're implementing this to um, and really implementing the intensity you should be, 20 minutes will be sufficient, 30 minutes will give you amazing results, but as you can see, there's different intensity levels. There's two, six, and eight, which we're actually using in this HIP program. Now, here's how we're gonna break it down. We've got intensity two, intensity six, and intensity eight here. So what we want to do is one revolution, or one cycle, goes for two minutes. So if we break that down, if we're you know, uh, quite a beginner, it may be 60 seconds at intensity um, two, it may then be 40 seconds at intensity six, and it may be 20 seconds at intensity eight. So intensity two is really just going through slowly. So it's going through slowly. So if we're on a spin bike, we might just be going nice and slowly. Intensity six is a bit more where we're getting the heart rate up, pre getting to the stage where um, we're starting to struggle to speak, we're um, getting quite puffed. Intensity eight is going flat out. Intensity eight is going flat out, but not to the point where you're about to throw up. So what that would look like really simply would be if you're on a spin bike, you want to spin bike for 60 seconds going through really slow. Once you hit the 60 second mark, 
you're then going at speed number six, where you're getting your heart rate up quite a bit for 40 seconds. You've then got a 20, min, uh, 20 second sprint where you're going flat out and getting to intensity level eight. That's one cycle, it takes about two minutes. Now, I want you to repeat that. You should be repeating that at least 10 times in total. So in real, reality, you're only doing 20 sets of, um, 10 sets of this in total. If you want to do 15, you definitely can. To be honest, if you're doing any more, then you're probably not working hard enough. Again, we can change these intensity levels. If, if you're a bit fitter, it could be something such as, you know, instead of uh, 60 seconds on level two, could be, you know, excuse me, level two could be uh, 20 seconds, level six could be a minute, and intensity level eight could be 40 seconds. Now that there would be for someone that's really, really fit, but to start off with, I want, I want you to start on this. 60 seconds of going through really slowly, 40 seconds of going at a good pace where you're getting your heart rate up, you're going quite quickly, and then 20 seconds of going flat out as fast as you can. If, if you repeat that 10 times, that's your hit training. You can do this with literally anything. You can do it with boxing. You can even do it with your weights. You can, you can do it with lots of plyometric stuff. As you can see in the booklet, you can just implement it there, but... Um, it, it really doesn't matter. As long as you're following these principles on hit day, as long as you're doing 20 minutes worth, as long as you're following these cycles, you'll get amazing results and it's extremely, extremely easy.